What is hope worth? I would assume that most of us, maybe all of us, would say hope is worth a ton. Because when you have hope, that keeps you energized and keeps you moving and keeps you excited, etc., etc., etc. And yet I think it's also valuable for us to ask the question, what do we mean when we use the word hope? I mean, I can say, I hope the Packers make the playoffs. Not looking so hot, is it? (laughs) I can say, I hope you have a wonderful Christmas season, which is kind of a pious wish. And I could say, I hope it gets to be 80 degrees this afternoon, which, by the way, I do hope for. (laughs) But that's kind of a fantasy, isn't it? And yet we can use that word hope to mean any of those three things, and it's a legitimate statement. So what are we talking about when we talk about real hope? What are we talking about when the Scripture, or better, what what is the Scripture talking about when it talks about hope? What does all this mean? Well, to help us understand it, Let's go back in time to about the year 587, maybe 586 B.C. So we're talking 25, almost 2,600 years ago. Jerusalem sits up on a hill. On one side, it kind of drifts off into a plain. On the other side, there are pretty steep valleys. In ancient times, it was protected by walls. You picture them? With gates. And outside the walls of Jerusalem, as our text is written, is the Babylonian army. And the Babylonian army has come with all its force and vigor. It's brought its siege ramps. And the soldiers are surrounding chunks of the city, maybe all of the city. Their battering rams are in place and they're banging the doors and banging the walls and looking to break it down. And oh, by the way, this isn't the first time the Babylonians have been there. The Babylonians came for the first time in 605 B.C. They conquered Jerusalem and Judah, the country around it. And Judah became a vassal state having to pay tribute to Babylon. Judah got sick of it. So around 598 or so, they stopped paying their tribute. Guess what? Nebuchadnezzar wasn't okay with that. (laughs) And so he came back with his armies, and he killed a bunch more people, and he deported a bunch more people. And for a while, they paid tribute again. And about 10 years later, they decided, we don't want to do this anymore. (laughs) What's the definition of insanity? (laughs) Yep. And so Nebuchadnezzar comes again, and this time Nebuchadnezzar is sick of making the trip. And so he's decided this time he's going to level the place. And he has come with his full army, and he is putting a beating on the city. Can you picture it? Can you imagine how you're feeling if you're inside the city? Can you imagine if somebody wanted to talk to you about hope? Hope? Are you kidding? You see that army? Do you see those battering rams? Hope? And if you can imagine, that's the context into which God gives our text. Jerusalem will live in peace and safety. A branch will sprout. A ruler who will do what is just and right in the land. Are are you kidding me? Could, Could they dare to hope? I mean, everything objectively said, no, there's no hope. Our, this, this, this city is going down and the country is going down. Can we dare to hope? Can you dare to hope? 
Can you dare to hope for a ruler who will rule in righteousness and do what's right? Can you dare to live in safety and to have salvation? Well, if our focus is on outward things, good luck. But God has much to say to us about the inward things, the spiritual things, the eternal things. And, but now we look inside of ourselves and we go, but man, there's a battle that's raging inside of me. Oh, it's easy for us believers to put on the veneer of things are going well and we've got things under control and we're living our lives trying to do it in a God-pleasing way. But oh man, what's going on on the inside? It's awful, isn't it? As Satan rages against us, as the world tries to allure us, our sinful thoughts, our sinful ideas, our sinful desires, they rage against our souls. And sometimes that battle, man, we lose it. And those sinful desires come spewing out of our mouths with sinful thoughts, sinful words, sinful deeds, sinful... Yeah. Can there be salvation for a battle-wrecked sinner like me? It would appear to be hopeless, wouldn't it? Ah, but thank God, not so. Why? First, because who your God is. There's this wonderful little Hebrew detail in this text that I've never seen before. I was so excited when I discovered this. The word that's used when Jesus, when God says he's going to fulfill the promise he's made, it's exactly the same Hebrew word that God used when he spoke to Noah. And he said to Noah, I'm going to fulfill a promise to you that I'm going to save you and your family from the flood. And it's kind of an unusual Hebrew word, so I don't think it's an accident that it got used here again. And so we flash back to Noah and his family. Did God save them from the flood? Yes, he did. Did God keep that promise to Noah and his family? Yes, he did. The ark lifted him up above that flood waters and the promise of salvation of the family of Noah was saved because God is faithful. And that God who is faithful to Noah was faithful to those people of Judah. Indeed, the day came when people came back to the land of Judah and re-inhabited Jerusalem, and Jerusalem again became a city and a place and a nation. And your God will be faithful to you and to me always. Can I have hope? Absolutely. And even more so because of the name by which he will be called. Our translation said the Lord our righteous Savior. That's not a terrible translation. A better translation would be the Lord our righteousness. Because God is talking in this text about something that Jesus is doing for you and for me. To get into heaven, what do we need? We need perfection. We need righteousness. We look into ourselves and what do we see? We see a mess. So what do we need? We need a Savior who could bring righteousness. And Jesus did exactly that. He stood up against the assaults of Satan. He stood up against the allure of the world. He lived perfectly and righteously, but not just for him. He was doing that for you. And oh yeah, when was he born? He was born at another time when Jerusalem and Judea was a wreck. The Roman armies inhabited the land. The people of Judah were sending off tribute to a, a pagan emperor, Caesar Augustus. The king of Judea wasn't even Jewish. He was a descendant of Esau. 
It looked as if David's glorious tree had been cut down. It was only a stump. And then a shoot sprouted. Life. New life. Not just any life, but God in the flesh. And he came, why? To bring life. New life. Not just any life, but eternal life. For all those who believe in him. The situation looked so hopeless. Was it? Not at all. Because God is faithful. And kept his promise. And the sprout sprouted from David's stump. And brought life. For you and for me. Can we have hope? Absolutely. And no, our hope is not just some pie in the sky. Oh, I sure hope it's nice tomorrow. I hope that the sun comes up tomorrow. Or I hope the Packers make the playoffs. I do hope the Packers make the playoffs, by the way, just to be clear. But no, this hope is real, firm, sure, confident hope. Because you have a God who is absolutely faithful. And this is real, firm, confident, sure hope. Because the name by which it will be called is the Lord, our righteousness. That is your hope. That is real hope. And that is hope not just for today, but that is hope that will go with you forever and ever. Amen?